Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. This is video number 16 in my series, An Introduction to Freediving and Spearfishing California. Today I'm up here on the Mendocino Coast and we are going freediving for sea urchin and other underwater delicacies. We're going to do a bit of foraging and we're going to make a one of a kind sea urchin pasta. Let's go. So first things first, I was on the north coast this weekend because I was guiding introductory spearfishing and freediving for sea urchin. So if you're interested, hit me up. So regardless of the interpretive displays that talk about red abalone, remember abalone is closed in California as of 2023. It has been closed for probably eight years. Now the abalone is closed because the seaweed is being grazed off by purple sea urchin. If you didn't watch that video, it's the only video that I've made that I really, really hope you do watch. I put a lot of time and energy into it. I'll leave a link right here. It discusses the whole situation with the die-off of the sunflower star and how that led to a purple sea urchin explosion. Those purple sea urchins have grazed off 95% of our kelp forests up here on the north coast and that has effectively starved out our abalone. That's why abalone has been closed, not due to overharvest by divers. So if you want to learn more about that, please watch that video. In the meantime, if you see an abalone, leave it where it is. So this is Van Dam State Beach. I don't usually blow up spots, but this is a known spot. Right out there on those rocks, that's where I speared my very first fish when I was 11 years old. Great spot for beginner divers here on the north coast, but remember, if you're gonna go out diving, if you're a beginner, it's not enough to go with a group of other beginners. You wanna go with people who have experience because there's a lot of things that can go wrong out in that water, and you don't wanna be out there relying on other folks who also don't know what to do if that situation pops up. So be sure to go with experienced divers if you're learning. Now, even though the water is super calm, there's a decent amount of brown and green in the water. So today it would be a safe place to dive, but your visibility is not going to be very good. We're going to bounce to another spot. So one of the things I'll do is actually elevate myself. I'll go up on top of a bluff so I can look down into the water. Or I'll get up on rocks and look down, and that allows me to see what the visibility might be like. Here you can see it's pretty murky, but as I make my way out onto the rocks, I find this area where I can see a kelp stalk. And that kelp stalk I can follow down into the water, and I can see at least maybe five feet. So if the visibility is five feet on the inside, it might be 12 feet on the outside. And so lucky for me, that's exactly what happened. I hopped in the water, swam out, and once I got over about 15 feet of water, I had about 12 feet of viz. So here we are over a sea urchin barren, and I wanna draw your attention to these little guys. These are turban snails. So don't just pay attention to that purple, but pay attention to everything else that's on the reef as well. Some of these blend in pretty well and they're incredibly delicious. I'm definitely planning on harvesting some of those and working them into my sea urchin pasta. We'll talk more about those in a little bit. So as always, I hit the surface, I'll be panting very hard because I'm out of breath. So I'm gonna spend some time there breathing without the snorkel in, and then once I've calmed enough, I'll throw the snorkel in, and then I wanna lay flat on the surface, breathe up, stay calm, catch my breath, and when I'm ready, drop back down. So let's talk about some NorCal species. It's always cool to see these juvenile rockfish. It's a real good sign of a healthy reef, and while there should be a tremendous kelp canopy here protecting them, at least we're seeing a few here. Now there's a number of other fish you're going to see throughout this video, but uh, let's talk about the most abundant. These are striped perch. You'll note that they have sort of a brownish-orange color and these purple to bluish lines that run down the length of their body. This one here is a kelp greenling. Kelp greenling have a strong sexual dimorphism, with females being more of an orangish to yellow color and males being more gray to blue. It's not a fish that I recommend for the very beginner beginner diver just because they do have a 12 inch minimum size, so I recommend you spear some perch and just kind of learn how 
Fish under magnification at the bottom tend to shrink as you bring them towards the surface. Once you really start to gauge what is 12 inches, then you can start to pursue 13, 14 inch kelp greenling. And here is a California red abalone. There are not nearly as many of these as there once were when I was a kid, even 10 years ago, but the few that I do see tend to be in the shallows and often on top of the rocks where there's still a little bit of seaweed. It seems like the sea urchin really don't like that surf zone, so they kind of stay a little deeper. So down here I'm pointing to some sea urchin at the base of the rock and saying, I don't want to go for those. I want to go for these sea urchins that are near the top of the rock where there's still some seaweed growing. Those top sea urchins tend to be the ones getting best fed and tend to have the highest yield of the reproductive organ, which is the edible portion we refer to as uni. Now just listen to this when I peel this urchin off the rock. It sounds like Velcro. How cool is that? <laughs> right here, I am opening up sea urchin to see whether or not it's got a decent yield. And I'll just go from rock to rock opening the sea urchin till I find one with good yield and then once I do, I'm gonna start picking sea urchin off of that rock. Now, as I said, you wanna pay attention to everything else growing on the reef as well. So right here is Laudia gigantea, the owl limpet. Edible, delicious, and I will do a video specific to that species pretty soon here. But I did grab a few limpets while I was out here as well, in hopes to throw those in my seafood pasta. Here, I'm grabbing tegula, AKA turban snail. These smaller turban snails, are two different species, black tegula and brown tegula. Both are delicious and you're allowed 35 per day in total. And that little guy that just blasted off the reef, that is a rock greenling, a subspecies of greenling that has incredible vibrant colors. I don't see these nearly as often as kelp greenling, but they are pretty abundant regardless. It's always important as underwater hunters that we memorize our size limits, our seasons, and our bag limits. Now I grabbed this turban snail and it turned out to actually be a hermit crab. Looks like the hermit crab already ate the tegula and took his home. So I'm going to put that one back. I'm going to search over the reef and try to find an actual turban snail. This turban snail here, you can see the actual foot, the meat that we want to eat. It's got that sort of black and tan or black and white kind of coloration. This is a beautiful anemone. Now, anemones kind of look like flowers, and that leads some people to think, oh, what a beautiful, wonderful thing. And it is a beautiful, wonderful thing. That is, as long as you're not a crab and happen to walk across it, in which case it's going to grab you, pull you in, and digest you from the inside out. <laughs> yeah, Mother Nature is ruthless, but that's part of her beauty. So once again, I'm hitting the surface. I'm panting at first. Once I catch my breath, I'm going to throw my snorkel in, and then I'm going to lay flat on the surface like I was saying before. It's super important that you focus on your recovery time. You need to be spending at least three to four times as much on the surface as you are underwater. I used to say two to three times, but really, I'm convinced. Three to four times as much. And so if you're down for two minutes, make sure you're spending six to eight minutes on the surface. Really, eight is ideal. And that allows you to really calm down and so you can breathe off that carbon dioxide that's building up in your lungs. We are going to talk about shallow water blackout and samba in a coming episode. Um, it is super important that you are spending enough time on the surface. And in the meantime, just remember, if you're not breathing up long enough, it's going to kill your bottom time. So it's a safety thing, but it's also just going to improve your underwater hunting. Yeah, so these little purple urchins, um, these are our problem species at this point. It's a native sea urchin, but it's acting like an invasive. And again, if you haven't seen my video specific to this story, please watch that video. This is an ecological crisis, and I feel very strongly that every one of us needs to know what's going on here. I mean, losing 95% of our kelp forests right under our noses is since 2013. Imagine how much carbon that sequesters and how much oxygen that would produce. But in any case, let's talk about what we can do in the meantime, which is eat more uni. So here I am dropping down. I'm just grabbing a few sea urchins from here and there. I'll grab one off this rock, one off that rock. And then uh, that way I'm kind of sampling through the water. Some of these are going to be empty. Some of these are going to be full. And, you know, I'm allowed 40 gallons per day if I'm diving in Sonoma County, Mendocino County, or Humboldt County. And that's because these are the counties where this uh, purple sea urchin explosion has really decimated the kelp forest. And remember that 40 gallons is specific to Strongylocentrotus purpuratus, the purple sea urchin, not the red sea urchin. 
You're going to see some reds down in here as well. I am going to drop down and grab a few reds, but uh, mainly I'm focusing on the purples because they are the species that right now is eating off the seaweed on the north coast. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of uh, purples and reds in Southern California as well, but we don't seem to have the same ecological crisis in Southern California with sea urchin barrens as we do in Northern California. Here I am cracking open a purple urchin once again, and I'm just looking to see what is that yield. If I crack some and they don't have much, I move on to the next one, keep cracking until I find a good spot where the uni looks nice and healthy. I'm looking for an amber color to a, a vibrant yellow, yellow orange. If it's brown or if it's empty, then I just move on. And I'll sample a couple, like this one. If it looks good, I can see that nice yellow uni, then I'm going to start grabbing some off that rock and bringing them up. So I'm really loading up on sea urchin, and when I guide this or when I do this on my own, I always take more purple sea urchin than I think I'm going to need. Um, because I know some of these are going to be empty. This is just a matter of diving in a sea urchin barren. It's different than when you're diving and grabbing some sea urchin that are in a totally healthy reef where there's a ton of seaweed, a ton of food for them to produce that uni. So because I know some of these are going to be duds, I'm still going to take them out of the water because I still don't want to leave them there because they can stay dormant for like 10 years without eating anything. And then if some seaweed comes by and falls on them and they eat it, they could then potentially build up enough of their reproductive organ to reproduce. Now I'm dropping down my float line here, which I use to mark this. Check it out. Behind the sea urchin, you see that orange lip? For those of you who have been watching the series, I know you already know what that is. But if you haven't been watching the series, this is a Pacific rock scallop. I am super excited about this, and I use that float line and my pry bar at the bottom as a weight to mark this spot so that I can get back to the surface, take a deep breath, dive back down, and really spend my time on it. I've had a lot of people requesting, hey, can I come out with you to do some scallop diving? And I'm telling you right now, scallop diving is a bit more advanced. So here you can see that I'm actually wiggling the rock in front of it and moving it. This is definitely a tip I want to impart to you folks is you dive down, if you really can't get access to something, think about it in terms of how would you do this if you were on land foraging the intertidal zone. You might move a rock and then move that rock back into place. But a lot of people don't even think about the potential of moving a rock when they're underwater. Um, when I dive down and I see something like this, I don't have much access, I just try to wiggle that rock. If the rock doesn't wiggle, well now I've got to kind of work my pry bar around it. But if it does wiggle, that might make this process way easier. So here I've got my sea urchin out. This one is a red sea urchin. I cracked it, opened it, and look at the, the uni there. It's like a very dark brown color. That's an unhealthy sea urchin, pretty much starving out, so I'm going to move that one to the side and crack one of these purples. This one I'm hoping for the best, and sure enough, it's also pretty much empty. Now at this point, people might get discouraged, but I'm already expecting this. So I crack another red here, open this guy up, and this one actually has a decent yield. Not a tremendous yield, but it's healthy. There's definitely some uni in there, and I'm going to scoop that out into my first water bath. So the way it works is I get one water bath with about a tablespoon of alum mixed in there. And that kind of helps uh, sort of cure and coagulate the, uh, the uni, keeps it from melting. I give it a first rinse in there, then I transfer it to a second rinse of clean seawater, and then a third rinse if I feel so inclined, if it needs a little bit more cleaning. And so this allows me to really clean that uni and I also 100% strongly recommend that you process your sea urchin as soon as you get out of the water. So bring some Tupperware, uh, bring a spoon, bring that alum, and be ready to process your sea urchin as soon as you get out of the water. Check this purple out. Little urchin, right? But look at how healthy that uni is in there. Beautiful, vibrant orange color. And you can see how the uni conforms to the inner curvature of the shell. And also how I use the spoon to scoop right along the inner curvature. This is extremely sensitive what I'm doing here. If you get violent with this, if you get overzealous and you're moving that spoon around, you're just going to scramble those eggs, so to speak. You got to be very, very delicate and careful here because uni is very delicate. So here I'm transferring it from my first bath to my second bath, and then again from my second bath to my third bath. Once it's nice and clean, I'll scoop those out and place them on paper towel on a plate, and that's going to go on ice. Once it's out of the shell, cleaned on ice, 
That can go in your refrigerator for like two or three days and be fine. I am super excited to make this uni pasta, but first, I just saw these. These are old alders. And as I was walking by, I noticed there were actually edible oyster mushrooms growing on the side of one of these. Now it's the middle of summertime, this is not really mushroom season on the coast, but we do have some summer flushes that actually occur because the marine layer comes in, that fog. It catches the trees and it drips down, and that fog drip sometimes up here on the north coast is sufficient moisture to fuel a small mushroom flush. If those oyster mushrooms are in good shape, I'm going to add them to my pasta. Please be 100% positive on your identification of any wild food, especially mushrooms. If you want to learn how to do this, again, I teach classes on this subject, and remember, when in doubt, throw it out. Very nice. That's a nice little cluster of oyster mushrooms. That's going in my uni pasta. Man, I have to safeguard my food again. Just like the north coast when I was doing that lingcod or perch, I can't remember, it was the perch. Perch and seaweed salad. I just had a seagull full on fly straight down into here and try to steal my scallop. Luckily it was too heavy. Anyway, I'm gonna process this bad boy and let's get this thing searing. Can you see him in the background? Don't even do it, buddy. All right, you know how we do it. I'm gonna grab the gut, grab the mantle, peel it away. I'm leaving only the white adductor muscle. True North Coast summer, now it's raining while I'm cooking. All right, we're keeping all that lovely seafood flavor in there. I'm throwing in some pretty roughly chopped garlic and shallots. I'm gonna let those cook first, and then I'm gonna throw in our herbs so they don't burn. I totally forgot the mushrooms. So I'm using half of them. I just threw them in here. I'm gonna brown them, and then that's all I'm adding to my pasta. I got a few more in my coffee cup here. I'll eat them for breakfast. I realized I forgot my Parmesan and my chili flakes, but luckily I went and got some pizza yesterday, so I got Parmesan and chili flakes. Alright, I had to pop the collar. There's mosquitoes like crazy out here right now. Uni pasta with wild harvested mushrooms, wild harvested scallops, and wild harvested turban snail and limpets. Could be good. <sighs> I thought I had enough of a breeze to keep these mosquitoes away, but there's a uh, cattail swamp right over here. All this area is getting a lot of coastal breeze, but there's mosquitoes. But check that out. So let me know why the uni didn't melt. Anyway, mushroom first. Mmm. Mmm. Subtle, sweet, creamy, but much more subtle than I thought it would be. It's a damn good pasta, but I feel like the, the uni could pop a little bit more. Black turban snails. Mm. The texture and flavor of those things, it's so good. It's like octopus. <laughs> it's really good. Get out of here, mosquito. Buzz off, mosquito. All right, it's gonna be a big bite. Look at that big old scallop. <laughs> Do I dare? I'm going for it. Mm. 
Mm. Wow. <laughs> Without a doubt, scallops are my favorite wild seafood. That is fantastic. <laughs> Look at those beautiful oyster mushrooms. Mmm. So I actually dove a cove on the way home, got another scallop, got some more sea urchin. Of course my GoPro did not work for whatever reason, but in any case I decided to recreate this, only this time I used cream and a whisk to make the uni sauce. This time I mixed this sauce in with everything after everything else was cooked, so this cream sauce was just added when the noodles and everything else was still pretty hot, but the pan was turned off and that kind of brought everything up to temperature and imparted this amazing cream texture. Round two, much, much creamier. Let's see how this one goes. Coated in uni. Oh my gosh. Round one was delicious, but this, this is what I was going for. 